Yeah, thank you, Pastor Dave. Okay, if you have your Bible, so you can grab a bulletin on the way in. At least have your phone turn open. Click. We're in Ephesians chapter six, verse sixteen. And yeah, we'll go ahead and dismiss the children now. You've, you've uh, age three to third grade, dismissing out the back. I assume that our children's ministry director, who's reading the scripture this morning, doesn't need to go with them, because I just dismissed them, Jen. <laughs> <laughs> if not, you'll catch up. Uh, we're in a uh, series, The Invisible War, uh, Overcoming Darkness Through Christ's Complete Victory. Part of, if you are new, our extensive series looking at the book of Ephesians, which we've been at for uh, about a year. Uh, we're in this um, uh, small series, The Invisible War. Uh, this is a series on spiritual warfare, a series on the whole armor of God. Uh, we have thus far covered the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of the gospel. Uh, that we come this morning to the shield of uh, faith. Uh, reading my passage, I want to introduce you to our children's ministry director, Jen Smith. Uh, Jen oversees our ministry for uh, children up to uh, for th- for f- f- fifth grade. Uh, she's in charge of children's church, Sunday school, Wednesday night, uh, uh, kids programs. You help with preschool a little bit. And I hear some really exciting things about VBS uh, coming up. So you have our passage. And I don't know if you need this. So there it is. Thank you. Okay, I'll be reading from Ephesians 6, verses 13 to 18. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. And as for shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given with the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. Amen. Thank you. Let's pray. Uh, Father, we need a touch uh, from you. We need a touch from your spirit. Uh, We pray that as we uh, engage in this spiritual work this morning, that we would have the spiritual help that we need to uh, focus uh, on you, to hear uh, your gospel, to hear uh, from you. So speak uh, to us, bring uh, revival, bring awakening uh, to our minds, to our hearts. Uh, Lord, we uh, hear hear your servants. We are ready. Speak to us. Uh, We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So we we come this morning to the shield of faith. Uh, This is a verse that I think on the one hand is quite sobering. Uh, It should give us a little bit of pause. Uh, Take up the shield of faith so that you might extinguish the flaming darts of the evil one. That should give us a bit of pause. That is a sobering uh, thought. Uh, This this is one of those sustained thoughts that we have had in this series. I think it's one of the burdens that Paul has as we have studied this passage collectively. Paul wants to wake us up uh, and wake us up not just to the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Of course, we need to wake up to that, but we wake up as well to the work of the enemy, that you and I have an enemy. That, that, that same act of grace that reconciled us to God antagonizes us to the devil. And so that you have an enemy. You have an enemy, and it's not the person sitting next to you. <laughs> you have an enemy. It's not that annoying co-worker. You have an enemy. Um, it's not some uh, a certain family member or friend. It is uh, the devil. Th- there was a certain simplicity that your life had uh, when you, we simply followed the prince of the power of the air. So Paul, with life was simple. There was no war. But then you came to know Jesus. And that act of grace that reconciled you to God antagonized you to the devil. Paul wants to wake us up to that. And so this, this is a sobering uh, verse. But I hope that you will agree with me, at least by the end of the sermon this morning, uh, that this is ultimately a very hopeful verse. Because the promise that is held out in this verse is that those flaming darts of the evil one, he says, can be extinguished. Uh, extinguished. Extinguished means to be put out, to be rendered useless or harmless. Uh, that's what we hold on to. Uh, as I was putting the sermon uh, together this, um, this, this week, I was thinking about the quote from Martin Luther, uh, who famously says, you know, you can't keep the birds 
from flying over your head. You know this? Did you know that Martin Luther said that? Can't keep the bird from flying over your head, but you can keep them from making a nest in your... Do you know it? It's in your hair, right? I can't keep those flaming darts from coming at me, but I can keep them, right, from doing the harm that the devil wants to do. Um, and so that's where we're headed. Um, I want you to notice how our passage uh, begins here in verse 16. Next slide. Um, this is a relatively simple phrase in uh, Greek, in all circumstances. That's how our passage begins, in all circumstances. Take up the shield of faith with which you can ex extinguish the flaming darts of the evil one. Uh, in the ESV, that's the translation of the Bible that we're using this morning, uh, they render this Pretty simple phrase, in all circumstances, uh, which cues us into uh, the fact that faith uh, always has a part to play. All right, we, there's, there's never a situation where uh, we, we step away or move beyond the shield of faith. We don't graduate from faith. We always need faith. In all circumstances, he says, you need the shield of faith. Uh, but there is some ambiguity in, this, uh, in the original Greek. So, for instance, in the NIV, some of you have sitting on your Bible... On your laps, the NIV, uh, it says, uh, in addition to all of this, uh, in addition to all of this, uh, in, in other words, uh, in the, uh, the, 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 you know, the, the meaning of that would be, uh, don't, don't forget about uh, the shield of faith. You've taken up the uh, belt of truth, and you've taken up the breastplate of righteousness, and you've taken up the shoes of the gospel, but don't forget about the shield of uh, faith. Uh, the King James Version, how many of you have a King James Version with you uh, here this, this morning? Not, not a soul. Okay. <laughs> Wait, we've got one over here. Uh, my family went down to the Bible Museum yesterday. We got to see the original, or one of, well, the first edition of the King James Version of the uh, of Bible published in 1611. Uh, the King James Version of the Bible renders this above all. Uh, above all, uh, take up the shield of, of faith. And, and, and in other words, uh, the, the translators of the King James are calling attention to the importance, to the absolute importance of the shield of faith. And I think we can see this even in the ESV. Just look at the amount of space that the Apostle Paul uses to talk about this shield of faith. I've already begun to write the sermon for next week, which is the helmet of salvation, and it's like four words. Here he takes an entire sentence. Actually, uh, of all six parts of the whole armor of God, Paul spends the most time talking about the shield of faith. There is an importance. There is a supremacy of the shield of faith. And so this is a, this is a sobering verse. It should give us pause, but I hopefully, hopefully you see that it is a hopeful uh, verse. It is an important verse. Um, as we engage this verse, I want to organize my sermon. I organize um, you know, what we're going to do here this morning around three big ideas. And uh, here they are. Number one, uh, darts are dangerous when aimed. Number two, shields are effective when used. Uh, then we'll finish kind of with a call to action. Therefore, I can stay in the battle. Darts are dangerous when aimed. Shields are effective when used. Therefore, I can stay in the battle. So let's dig in here this morning. First big idea as we engage this verse, darts are dangerous when aimed. Uh, in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Uh, how many of you, uh, growing up, you had a mother that did not let you run with scissors? <laughs> a few of you? Uh, I remember this more from my grandmother than from my uh, mother, and I'll tell you, I'm sure we got away with all sorts of things as kids growing up, but that was just the line in the sand. I remember when I was over at my grandmother's house, don't you run with those scissors. <laughs> You can get away with so many other things, but don't run with uh, scissors. Uh, and definitely don't throw them, because <laughs> they're sharp. They're dangerous. Uh, when we come to uh, this verse, we find the devil doing exactly this. Although he's not just running with scissors, uh, we find out that he's throwing them. And he's not just throwing them indiscriminately in the air. What we find out is he's aiming them, right? Because that's what you do with a dart. You aim it. And by the way... He set it on fire before he aimed it at you. That's why this is a sobering verse. This is why this is a verse that should give us pause. Um, this is a verse in this section that gives us some glimpse into how 
the devil uh, works. Uh, as, as we already said earlier, uh, I think that the primary burden that Paul has is to wake us up uh, to the reality of the devil. He's trying to wake us up to the spiritual reality of things going on around us. That's, that seems to be uh, wh where he's primarily headed. And so, so we don't have a whole lot of information about how exactly it is that the devil works. It's there, but his primary burden is just waking us up to, to, to remind us that we have an enemy. Uh, it is the devil. Um, this verse, though, gives us a, a little bit of insight as to how uh, the devil uh, works. The devil's work is pictured as a flaming dart. A flaming dart. And I wonder, can you capture that image um, in your mind? We're not talking about someone running carelessly with some sharp object that might cause injury. Now, what Paul says is, you have an enemy, he is the evil one, and he's taking a dart... He's taking something sharp, and he's setting it on fire, and he's aiming it at you. And the point of that is to cause pain. The point of that is to destroy you. The thief comes only to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And it's right at us. So, some of you I know, as we engage uh, this topic of the flaming darts of the evil one, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You, you have firsthand experience with what we're talking about here. Uh, you, you know those uh, thoughts of temptation that just invade your mind from out of nowhere. You, you know those dark thoughts of accusation that seem to come at you from nowhere. Some of you know exactly what we're, what we're talking about this morning. And I tell you, if you don't realize that this is one of the ways the devil works, well, what's the result? What happens if we don't realize that this is one of the way the devil works? I'll tell you, one of the things that happens is we, we, we end up psychologizing everything. And that's not to say there's not ever a psychological explanation for some of those dark thoughts, some of those things that come into our head. But if we're blind to the fact that this is one of the ways that the devil comes against you, you psychologize everything. And then what happens? You internalize it. And so we need to be aware. We need to be aware that this is one of the ways the devil works. Uh, listen to how Martin Luther describes these, uh, these flaming darts. He says, the, um, the devil throws hideous thoughts into the soul. Hatred of God, uh, blasphemy, and despair. When I awake at night, the devil tarries not, doesn't delay, to seek me out. Uh, he disputes with me and makes me give birth to all kinds of strange thought. And interesting, it's interesting to hear how Martin Luther uh, describes these spiritual battles that he's in. And I think in, in, in our day, we would, uh, yeah, we would be tempted to psychologize what Martin Luther was talking about. You'd say, you know, <laughs> you know Luther, 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 man, you just had a bad dream. Uh, you, you, just, you just have anxious thoughts that have come into your head. You just have some unresolved issues about your day that you just haven't uh, fully uh, uh, surrendered or, or, or figured out. But Luther is quite clear. He says, the devil. It's the devil who's throwing those thoughts into uh, my soul. Uh, it's important. It's important. And again, I've been careful to, to try to make this point every, every week. I'm not trying to spiritualize uh, every dark thought that you have. But we need to be aware that sometimes there is a spiritual explanation for what's going on around us. And so we need to grow in our awareness of these flaming darts. To that end, I want to give you um, uh, three categories of uh, flaming darts, three kinds of flaming darts that I think are often uh, flung at us. Um, so th three kinds of flaming darts. Number one, um, temptation, right? The, the flaming dart of temptation. If you are, uh, thank you, Pastor Dave, for reminding us of our Bible reading plan. If you are doing our Bible reading plan, you read Luke chapter 4 uh, this week. Uh, this was the temptation of, uh, of Jesus. We recited this in our men's Sunday school class as well, and I was reminded that uh, Jesus was actually full of the Holy Spirit. He was full of the Holy Spirit and exactly where God wanted him to be, and then the devil comes at him in temptation. So one of the things that maybe that, that should cue us in on is, uh, you know, when God is at work in your uh, life, when you are full of the Holy Spirit, sometimes that is when the devil is raging uh, the, the, the strongest against us. Just because I have been tempted does not mean that I have fallen into sin. Why do we say that? Because Jesus was without sin 
And yet Jesus was tempted in every way. Um, so, so we think about these flaming darts of, of temptation. Uh, again, m- many of us are probably very familiar with that. Others of us maybe take this stand that uh, for some reason you are above temptation. Uh, like that, that was something that I dealt with when I was a baby Christian, but now some, for some reason I have arrived. The Apostle Paul has some advice for you. He says, any of you who, uh, this is 1 Corinthians chapter 10, any of you who think you are standing firm, take heed lest ye fall. Because no temptation has seized you except for that which is common to man. So we never arrive beyond this point of temptation. We will never graduate from, from uh, the, the ability of the devil to fling these flaming darts of temptation at us. And so we need to be aware of that. We need to be aware of it. And I'm not saying that every temptation that we face is from uh, the, the, the devil. We can certainly do a good enough job ourselves bringing temptation upon ourselves. But that is certainly one of the ways that the devil works. Uh, so that's one category, temptation. Um, how about this, fabrication. The fa- flaming darts of fabrication. That's a, just a fancy way to continue rhyming. Uh, what I mean is lies. <laughs> it's the lies of the devil. Uh, Jesus in John chapter 8 verse 44 says the devil's a liar. And the father of lies. Uh, you know, Martin Luther. Uh, one little word shall fell the devil. Liar. Uh, uh, the devil flings these flaming darts of fabrication against us. Uh, we believe lies about God. God hates you. God doesn't care about you. Uh, you've, you've gone too far this time. Uh, uh, God is holding back on you, right? Wasn't that the lie that uh, he whispered into Eve's ear? Uh, we believe lies about others. The, these flaming darts that come to us uh, concerning others. That person over there doesn't care for you. They're judging you. It's, it's, uh, it's that, that uh, idea that wells up within us that where we're tempted to believe the worst about someone. Again, I'm not suggesting that that's the only explanation, but could there be a spiritual explanation for that? That's where the devil is seeking to work. Um, you know, we believe lies. So lies about God, lies about others, uh, lies about uh, ourselves. And maybe lies about ourselves we could fit into this, this final category um, accusation. Uh, so, flaming darts, temptation, fabrication, uh, accusation. Uh, you know, Satan, uh, one, of the, one of the things he's known for is to be, he is the, known as the accuser. Satan is the accuser. Uh, Holy Spirit's known as the advocate. Satan is known as the accuser. Uh, and it's these, these lies that he flings at us, these accusations that he flings at us that perhaps are, are uh, the most destructive of all, the flaming darts. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we had one of the most uh, vulnerable uh, testimonies we've had on this stage in, in some time. A uh, young, young man, Raymond, uh, shared, uh, shared his walk with the Lord and kind of gave voice to uh, these, these voices of uh, self-hatred and self, uh, uh, self-loathing. Uh, and I think this connected with, with a number of us. This is, you know, t- this is the work of the devil. Right, that's the work of the devil. That, that self-hatred that can fill our minds and fill our hearts is the work of the devil. Those lies, those flaming darts that he flings our way that says, you know, you're worthless, you're useless, uh, you're stupid, you're ugly. You, you, you know probably very, very well what I'm talking about. And, and the problem with, in Christian circles is many of these things can mimic uh, humility. It, it can look like humility because you're, you're, you're having a very low view of, your, of yourself. And so the devil is just having his way. Um, It is no humility, though, to believe these lies. It is no humility to live like an orphan if God has said you are a son or a daughter. It's no humility to live as if you are a condemned criminal if Jesus died to set you free. It's no act of humility to spend your life living in a dark pit if Jesus died has come to rescue you from darkness and to place you in the light. Now, here's, your, here's your homework assignment for, for you this, this week. I want you to, to uh, spend some time thinking about um, these three kinds of uh, darts, temptation, fabrication, accusation. See if you can identify uh, where, the, where, where are you facing that uh, in your life. Where, where is that? And again, does it mean that there's always a spiritual explanation? Does it mean that it's always uh, from the devil? But these are the things we face. And we need to know what to do about it. Um, and that leads me to the, uh, to the next big, big idea, next big thought here. Uh, so darts are dangerous when aimed. And number two, uh, shields are effective when used. 
Darts are dangerous when aimed, but shields are effective uh, when used. Um, and if we could back up just a, uh, just a minute, um, whenever this topic of um, these flaming darts uh, comes up, um, I think w w one of the questions I have, one of the questions that certainly plenty of people have asked me is, how do I know if that flaming dart is actually from the devil? You know, you know, aren't you just trying to, you know, this is just, uh, you're over-spiritualizing things, uh, Pastor. Doesn't, just because I had some thought that I can't explain, how do I know that that is from the devil? What about my own flesh? What about, um, you know, just worldliness um, in my life? And I think, well, the, you're on to something. Uh, at the end of the day, though, I'm not sure it particularly matters exactly where that flaming dart comes from. Because our response, the answer uh, is the same. It does not matter where that flaming dart came from. Because the answer is the same. What is the answer? The answer is to put my faith in Jesus Christ. The answer is the gospel. The answer is to stand. This is what we've been saying every Sunday. To stand in the victory of Jesus Christ. To take up the shield of faith. This was the single thought that, uh, that radically, and I mean this without exaggeration, that changed my life many years ago, was coming to see those things that are coming at me. It does not matter if, if it's even from my own flesh. Because the answer is the gospel. The answer is to stand in the victory of Jesus Christ. It doesn't, doesn't mean that, there's, that I don't need to, to repent of something. But the answer is to put on the gospel. And so I don't need to own that flaming dart. Because I can stand in the victory of Jesus Christ. It's not like there's a different shield of faith that we take up if, if this is the flaming dart from the devil and this is a flaming dart from my own flesh. The answer is the gospel. There's just one gospel. Paul says there's one body, one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. It's just one gospel. It's the gospel that preaches to us, on the one hand, our utter inability to win this battle. It's the gospel that preaches uh, to, to us that oftentimes there is some bit of truth dipped. <laughs> the devil, devil dips that dart into some bit of truth before he aims it at us. That's why it's so dangerous, because we know there's some shadow of truth with it. And the gospel preaches that to us. It says, yeah, th th there often is some realm of, of truth there. But the gospel points us to the complete and utter sufficiency of the cross of Jesus Christ. That's why Paul says, I will boast all the more gladly of my own weakness that the power of Christ might rest on me. That he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him. So I can stand in the light and I can fasten on the belt of truth and put on the breastplate of righteousness. Not get into a shouting match with a demon. The answer is the gospel. And you know, the, the Greek word that Paul uses here for shield um, is an interesting one. It's used only one time in the Bible. Um, and it indicates not that teeny little Captain America shield from the Marvel movies. The shield that is in view here is a full-length body uh, shield. Uh, as a matter of fact, the, the more literal translation of that word is door, because it was the size of a door. Uh, that's really uh, interesting. It's the kind of uh, shield that a Roman soldier would have used. Um, I went digging in uh, the writings of Josephus this week. Some of you know the name Josephus. Josephus, first century Jewish uh, historian, uh, lived just after the time of the apostles. Uh, he wrote extensively of what was going on in this time period. In one of those uh, books that he has, he describes the fall of Jerusalem, which led ultimately to the destruction of the temple, and describes the the Roman aggression against uh, the, the Jews, and he describes these soldiers. He describes these soldiers as standing behind these shields, and he says something really interesting. The Roman shields actually interlocked with one another. Uh, and it was quite a formidable force then against the Jews as the Romans would lock their, uh, their shields. Uh, and what Josephus says is that entire unit of soldiers then became as one fierce man who <laughs> came against the Jews. That's an interesting image. I'm not sure if that's what Paul has in mind, but it is interesting to note that as Paul writes this, he writes it in the plural form. So he's not just calling you and you and you and you to take up your shield of faith. He's calling us all collectively. 
collectively to take up our shield of faith. What an interesting image, isn't it? It's a good, powerful reminder for us that the Christian life is not meant to be lived alone, that we need our shield of faith, but we need a shield of faith that interlocks with someone else's shield of faith. You know, if I could, um, <laughs> this is an important topic for us to, um, to, to talk about. If I could just make uh, some quick application uh, f- from this. I think that the pandemic has accelerated a dangerous trend, not just in the world, but within the church towards isolation, where we just get busy trying to do our own thing apart from relationship with others. You, you, you need a shield of faith that interacts with someone else's shield of faith. If I could talk to those of you who are sitting at home, uh, this morning, and I don't want to, um, I don't want to throw any flaming darts at you. You have, there are many good reasons for, for folks sitting at home and watching church online. But I want to plead with you to find Christian community, to find brothers and sisters in Christ with whom you can do life together. And if I could talk to those of you who are here, it's very easy, isn't it, to hide in community. It's very easy to come to church on Sunday morning and just go through the motions and still not be known. We need community. We, we need open, vulnerable, Christ-centered, Bible-centric community. It's easy to hide in community even when we are with others. Join a life group. Join a men's group. Join a women's group. Join something. Figure out how to make that happen. Our, we need a shield of faith that interlocks with someone else's shield of faith. Um, let me talk a little bit more about what this shield of faith does. We, we understand um, that, that, that faith in itself has no protective power, right? F- faith in itself has no protective power. In other words, we don't have faith in faith. It, it's not just the fact that you have faith that's going to get you through your troubles. N- n- no, it's, it's what that faith points to. The, the shield of faith here is significant because it latches, it lays hold of two things, God's power and God's promises, the, the shield of faith, the faith that we're talking about is a faith that lays hold of God's power and God's promises. And here, here's how it works. Here's how it works. You have a flaming dart uh, that's thrown uh, your way. The devil comes and, and tempts you, puts some, uh, some temptation before you. And, and you call to mind God's promises. No temptation to seize you except which is common to man. But God's faithful and he will provide a way out. You know, the devil uh, throws a dart at you, comes to you, says you, you're worthless, you're a fraud, you're stupid. And you remember the words of Ephesians chapter 1? No, he chose me before the foundation of the world that I should be holy and blameless before him. The devil throws that dart at you and says you are not loved. And you say, no, I have been predestined for adoption to God himself through the Son, through Jesus Christ. The devil comes to you and says, that sin is too much. You really crossed the line this time. You should have known better. And you say, no, I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate me from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. The devil throws that flaming dart at you and says, you're alone. And you open God's word and you read, so you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. The devil throws that flaming dart at you and says, no one likes you. And you open God's word and read, I am a member of the household of God built on the foundations of the apostles and the prophets. The devil throws that dart at you and says you have no purpose. Your life is meaningless. And you say, no, I am his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. See, the shield of faith lays hold of God's power by laying hold of God's promises. Somebody in the worship service earlier said it. I I I need to know scripture in order for the Holy Spirit to bring it to mind. We're looking at the revival that's going on in Asbury right now. If you don't know that, go and Google that after the service. I don't know what to make of it. I'm really excited for it. You want to see the work of the Holy Spirit? If the Holy Spirit were to fall down on us like fire, how long would that fire burn? What does he have to burn up? Go through the two Bible verses we know and off he goes. 
It's faith that lays hold of the God's promises. I need to know God's promises. I need to be in community. Dr. Dangerous went aimed. We're at a war. Dr. Dangerous went aimed. But the shield of faith is effective when used. Let, let me, we'll end with this. Therefore, therefore I can stay in uh, the, the, the battle. You and I engaged in a great war. We're engaged in a battle. Paul says it's not against flesh and blood, but against the spiritual rulers and the spiritual powers and the spiritual principalities of this dark world. That same act of God's grace that reconciled you to God the Father antagonized you to the devil and so that you have an enemy. But uh, Paul says here you have been provided with the whole armor of God and you've been provided with the whole armor of God that you might be able to take a stand against the devil. But I do not need to live in fear. I do not need to live running from one danger after another. I don't have to live in uncertainty. I can stand and I can face what is coming against me. And I firmly believe that the tactic of the devil here is to take us out of the battle. The tactic of the devil is to take you out of that battle. But because we are in Christ, we can face these things head on. We resist the temptation to psychologize every flaming dart that is flung at us. We resist the temptation to internalize it. We think of uh, the Apostle Paul's last words, or some of his last words, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, a letter he wrote to the pastor at Ephesus. He says, I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. I have fought the good fight, he says. He says, his life is a fight. Our life is a fight. You've been given the shield of faith. You've been given the armor of God so that you might stay in the battle. And can I ask you this morning where your battle is? Where is your battle line? Where is God calling you to push back against the darkness that is pushing in on you? That's why you have been given the whole armor of God. Where is God calling you to take a stand? For, for some of you, it's, it's something internal, right? It's, it's something, it's our, it's our thought life. It's those things that are coming at us. We need to take up the, the whole armor of God and push back against the darkness. For some of us, your battle line is in your marriage. Uh, others, maybe it's, it's, it's with some other close relationship. It's within our, our family, perhaps. <laughs> you know, I've always scratched my head when Paul uh, lists kind of the signs of the end of time. He talks about uh, how awful things are going to be. People will be boastful. They'll be proud. They'll be slanderous. They'll be unforgiving. And then he throws this in there. And they'll be um, disobedient to their parents. And that always made me scratch my head until I started to put this series together. And I thought, you know, something that's exactly where the devil works. That's why he names that, because that's exactly where the devil works. The devil wants to destroy your marriage. The devil wants to, to disrupt your family. And so that's, that's where our battle is. For some of us, that battle lies within, uh, within our calling. Are you using the gifts that God has given you to be a blessing to others? Are you on mission for him? Where is your battle? We take up the shield of faith that we might stay in the battle. I'll leave you with um, the words this morning of Ephesians 6.11 as we invite the praise team to come up. He says, put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. You have been given the shield of faith. You have been given the whole armor of God that you might take a stand in the battle that you are in to face those things head on with the victory that Jesus has already won. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this uh, glorious promise held out um, in this verse. And in verses like this that remind us not just of the, of the darkness around us, not just of the spiritual reality, but of the true uh, Christian hope that we have, that these flaming darts of the enemy can be extinguished. Lord, we, we live such fleshly existence, 
I live such a worldly existence, just blind, uh, not just to the devil, but blind to the Holy Spirit and blind to what it is that you are doing around us. Lord, we would confess, I would confess on behalf of the people who are gathered here this morning, uh, the, the ways in which we have just lo- uh, allowed ourselves to, to, to lie down in the midst of that battle, not resting in your victory, but just <laughs> lying down in defeat and letting, uh, letting the devil, letting the world, letting our own flesh have uh, its way. Lord, would you fill us in fresh ways that this morning uh, with this gospel of peace that Paul writes about here, that you would fully equip us with this whole uh, armor of God, that you would wrap around us not only the belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness and these gospel shoes, but yes, Jesus, this shield of faith. Lord, would you bring to mind, Lord, make us true students of your word, that we might know your word, that we might put our faith uh, in your word. Lord, we we repent of those, those ways in which we've not made it a priority in our life, that we have filled our mind and we filled our lives with so many other things. Lord, would you give us a burning passion to know you and to love you. Uh, And Lord, we we know we can't love you if we don't know you. And so Lord, help us to know you. Help us to know you through your word. Would Would you begin that spiritual work within us? Let it begin with our leaders here. Let it begin, Lord, with those who call on your name. Jesus, we love you. Lord, help us to stand in the light of the gospel. This we pray um, in your name. Amen. Amen.